Ice is very important, I see, but there's not much scriptural mention. So this will probably be one of the few teachings or one of my first teachings where I'm going to go into uncharted territory and I'm just going to throw you out my possibilities, but I'll also mention certainties as well. And, but overall, I believe in studying deep into the scriptures and we should glean and find. Not just ignore and say, well, you know, I should stop searching or I shouldn't teach in this one. No, you should keep searching. Amen. You know, as long as it's not a teaching that burdens the body of Christ, that's the thing. That's where I don't go into. Amen. I try to do something that edifies the body of Christ. I try to do something, if it is truth in the Bible, then I have to teach it. So I go in those different, uh, those are the different situations that I would teach it. Okay, but anyways, let's get down to this teaching. There's a lot of... Interesting things. The first thing that I want to talk about concerning ice, why it would be important, is that obviously the origin, which is a no-brainer, it ought to be from the Almighty God. The Almighty God, the great I am that I am, He just spoke the whole world into existence. But when He spoke the world into existence, it also has to do with ice. When he spoke it, when it comes out of him, when he exhales, a lot of it, it also comes from his word, from his inside him, from his breath. Look at Job chapter 37, verse 10. The word of God reads, by the breath of God. See that? Now, breath, uh, God breathed, has to do with scripture inspiration. How about that? And you see ice coming along in there. Frost is given and the breath of the waters is what? Straightened. So the waters, they become straight. Why? It becomes ice. That's why I think this teaching might be important because for some weird reason, it can tie to inspiration. That's pretty interesting. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that uh, inspiration means ice, yeah, or something like that, you know. So I don't want you to go around and then, you know, teach something heretical. But I see something here that within the plane of the breath of God, because inspiration means God breathe. Within that same uh, territory, you see ice, which is very, very strange. So ice makes things certain and still from God's breath right? Well, think about God's Word. It's unbreakable. Kind of like it's hard and straightened out like ice. And it's still, it's sealed. So ice is within the territory, the same territory as here, not because it is inspiration, but rather because it has to do with the idea that God, He does something where it's blocked and locked. It's blocked and locked and it's at a standstill. So that's the first clue that I find. Now, what we see even more is look at Job 38. Job 38. Now this is God speaking. So this is what God says at verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the where whirlwind. So God is speaking. So this is not just Job's friend talking about their spiel like at the previous chapter that we read. So even if in the previous chapter it was uh, somebody speaking, Job 38 is plain that this would be God speaking about ice. Now look at this at verse 29. What did he say at verse 29? Verse 29. This is still coming from God. It doesn't change that fact. So that's why the previous verse stands. Look at verse 29. Out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven? Who hath gendered it? Isn't that really interesting? God ties uh, the ice to be born from Him. Now, if we think about inspiration here, it's God breathed, right? So it comes from God too. But the Word of God is where the Bible talks about an incorruptible seed being born. Being born from the Word of God. How about that? Everything that has to tie over here, you know, is within the same line, which I don't know, which I don't know. But the point is, is that it comes from God. And it's born from God. So God takes I seriously. Now, there is one thing that we know. 
What we do know about God, what he did with the ice, is one clue. We're going to look at the book of Revelation 5. I'll look at Revelation 5. And then there's another passage I want you to turn to is Genesis 1. Genesis 1. The clearest evidence where you're going to get about this ice is when you look at the sea of glass. That's the first clue. That's the clearest I can find. So I started from there. So uh, we started from God. We see that. We started from God. He's the one that created it. So out of his mouth, it comes out. But then the next clue would be that sea of glass. That sea of glass for some of you who don't know. The sea of glass for some of you who don't know is referring to the sea of glass that is above. It is the floor of heaven and the roof of the universe. It divides there. There is no doubt that there is a sea of glass. That much is certain. Amen. Now think about it. Where did it come from then? Right? Where did it come from? Uh, came from there. God spat it out. He, it came from His womb and He did that. So that sea of glass is something from the Lord then. Now let's look at uh, Revelation 5 to uh, see the comparison. And the Bible calls it sea of glass. Alright, I don't know why took my hand out of Revelation 5. That was a dumb thing to do. Here we are. We're going to look at Revelation 4, excuse me, not 5. We're going to look at Revelation 4. I'll look at verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. So we see here it's a sea of glass. Now, it's the floor of heaven. So think about it. it is, is it true that there's a bunch of waters where it became frozen at the outer edge of the universe. If you study science, they see large bodies of water. And if you know science and you go out toward further, further away to the universe, it gets colder and colder. So that sounds pretty logical. But let's look at Genesis 1. It fills in the gap and the missing answers for you. So in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says in, the, in verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Those are the waters. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. But what did He do with these waters? Look at this, at verse 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and God divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. So, meaning here then, that if God has to divide uh, above and below the firmament, the waters, then that means there's a firmament in between the waters. Now remember, waters are above and below, right? So waters are above and below. With the waters being above and below, with the firmament in between... And what is the firmament? Why, it's referring to outer space. So, uh, I'm not going to read that passage because I showed it to you uh, last Bible study, uh, last Wednesday night, and I've taught it many times in the teaching. All you have to do is read verse 14 through 17, and that shows you that the firmament is uh, referring to outer space over here. So, understanding that the firmament is referring to outer space here, this is the middle, right? And then the waters above and below. Now, the waters below the firmament, what did he call it? Just keep reading. The Bible says at verse 9. Uh, so verse 8, excuse me. And God called the firmament heaven, right? So he called this outer space heaven, now, for some of you who don't know, there are obviously several heavens. And then uh, this heaven, outer space, is distinguished from the heaven that is God's throne where he lives. Right, right. So we know that. Right. So notice what God says, the waters under this heaven, right? So we can guess that should be the waters in our earth today. But let's keep reading. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place... But what did he call them at verse 10? 
The waters that are under here called the what? Seas. So he called them sea. Wouldn't it be logical that he calls the water above sea too? Yes, at Revelation 4, he called it sea of glass. So there's no doubt. So in these two passages, that's the next clue that we find that the ice is over here then. The ice is over here. Now, some of you might be wondering, why did God put waters at Genesis 1-2, right? Something happened. Well, what happened is verse 1. Verse 1. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So he just created heaven and earth. So he, there was like no outer space and all that kind of stuff. But look what happened here. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. After he created, all of a sudden there's a cataclysmic event where there's waters everywhere. You might say, why is that? It's because the reason why is because Lucifer was living on the earth and with the sons of God at the beginning when the earth was created. And then God, what did He do? Is that He drowned them all out with a universal flood right. that time. Right. Then He divided everything where He created like the third heaven and then the outer space and then, you know, dry land and all that kind of stuff. So then He started to divide things. But back then, everything was where... It was all combined and everybody can go wherever they wanted. And then God just sent... So God had to send a universal flood to drown out everything. Uh, the passages to prove this... Uh, I'm not going to go through these verses because my members already know them. But all you have to do is go to uh, Job. Was it 39 that we looked at before? So all you have to do is go to Job 39. And then God says that the morning stars, the sons of God, they were there when God laid the foundation of the earth at the beginning. And then if you go to uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, it talks about Satan. He was on the earth before mankind. Roaming on the earth before mankind. So, uh, you can watch my video, The Genesis Gap. The Genesis Gap. If you watch The Genesis Gap, that, or The Gap Theory, then it will give you more teachings. And it's actually Job 38, not 39. So, if you look at, so Job 38 would talk about the sons of God were there at the beginning. So just taking that for granted, I'm not going to compare all those verses, okay? But taking that for granted then, I think that what we can see is our first ice age here. You might say, why is your, this is where your ice age comes from. The scientists talk about an ice age that happens to explain some kind of natural environmental conditions. But if they talk about an ice age, it would be Genesis 1-2. You would say, why would it be Genesis 1-2? The reason why it would be an ice age of Genesis 1-2 is because he had to send water throughout the entire universe. And remember, if the universe is so cold, then what would happen? It would turn into ice. But not only that, where do waters come from? What did the Bible say? It comes from what? God sent it down. God sent it down. So what did he do? All he did was when Lucifer and the sons of God said, yeah, we're going to take over the universe and everything that God says, and God just says, whew, like that. And then blows them away like dust, like that. And then just freezes out the whole thing. Now that's what I find intriguing here. What I find intriguing here is that we see that this has to do with from God, and that means God breathed, uh, which... Inspiration provides life, right? I see a contradiction which is pretty interesting. Which I don't know. I see life here from this, but I also see non-life. You might say, why non-life? Why non-life is because of this first example here. This first example, why would God send that uh, universal flood? It's to get rid of life and existence in there. It's to freeze it all out. Not only that, if you uh, common sense things in life within God's creation, the evidences of God's creation shows that a lot of times when you get something cold or ice, that's not something where it provides more life. It would, also, it would be more of non-life or kill life or fade away life. So, which is very interesting. It's, it's showing that you're trying to get rid of life. But then I see also other, uh, places where it can do with life too, right? What we saw, it can't come from God. 
But I'm going to show you some other things. I'm going to show you some contradictions here. Some contradictions. Uh, several contradictions where we can see is one example about uh, the cold. Let's look at the cold. The Bible, when it talks about the cold, there are contradictions here. Let's look at verse Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. I see life, but I also see non-life. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25. And then we'll look at verse 13. We're going to look at Proverbs chapter 25. And then we'll read verse 13. The Bible says, As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him. For he, what? Refresheth the soul of his master. So that's giving life. That's giving life. The Bible also talks about Proverbs 25, 25. Go to Proverbs 25, 25. Notice that the cold has to do with something giving life, not killing life. As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. So notice here that it has to do with giving life. You'll notice Matthew 10. Matthew 10. Go to Matthew chapter 10. And then we'll look at verse 42. Matthew chapter 10. And then we'll look at verse 42. Notice it has to do with giving life, not taking away life. Matthew 10, 42. So we're going to put cold here. So I was so interested. Not just water, but something that has to do with the cold. Freezing. Ice. Snow. The cold terrain. I, I was very interested in that. I, I don't know what the Lord, what he, why He created cold and what's His intention behind cold. I see a contradiction. Let's look at Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42. The Bible says, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So it gives life, it gives refreshing. But then I see that God also says the opposite. Matthew 10 talks about the cold as something good, but it also talks about it as something bad. Look at Matthew 24. Look at Matthew chapter 24. It has to do what I can see here as fading away life. The opposite. Non-life. Look at Matthew chapter 24 verse 12. Verse 12. Notice that the love of Jesus Christ is no longer lively or energetic. It becomes weak, fading, dying out. Matthew 24, 12. And because iniquity abound, the love of many shall wax what? Cold. 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 You turn cold. Let's look at uh, Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 3. Now, we know this, that when uh, the Bible talks about your faith waxing cold, that's pretty uh, dead. That's pretty bad. But the, when the Bible says that you're hot for the Lord or you're on fire, right? We, need, we know those references in the Bible. That's a positive trait. That's energetic. That's being lively. Amen. But then we see here at verse 14 and 15, it's negative again. Uh, verse 15, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Look at verse 16, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot... I will spew thee out of my mouth. So notice here that this cold and hot has to do with a spiritual condition. So we see here that now that there's something, that spiritual condition involved, and God likens it that when it's bad, He puts it as cold. But then again, you see that there's something good about the cold that has to do with giving life again and refreshing new life. Wait a minute. Right here. That might be the clue. Refresh. Renew. Give life again. It's not starting life. 
It's rejuvenating your current life. That might solve the contradiction. You might say, why? What this ice could mean is this, is that it's getting rid of uh, life, but then it's starting something new. It's refreshing. It's refreshing and starting something new again. So it might have to do with something like that, I see. So in a sense, life is non-existent because why? He gets rid of it. But in a sense, life is continuing. It's refreshed. Why? Because he didn't... Uh, he, he, even though he drowned out the whole universe, he did not completely get rid of the universe. Right. He's still using it. He started a recreation, refreshing process. Amen. Now, when I think about that, then it would make sense with a lot of other things. Okay, let's build up this idea here. When God talks about cold, all right, and your faith waxing cold, your spiritual condition waxing cold, you know what that is? You're a dead Christian then. You're a dead Christian. Now, the Bible talks about being dead. Go to Ephesians. We're going to look at the book of Ephesians. Uh, um, look at chapter 5. Chapter 5. And then we'll look at verse 14. Ephesians 5, 14. The Bible says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. light. So notice here, there is such a thing as concerning about dead Christians. And what we mean by dead Christians is that where the Bible, uh, when the Bible talks about dead Christians, that means that their faith, right, that their living and their service for him, so their works within their faith, so to speak. That their life is pretty much dead for him. So their service becomes dead. There is such a thing as that, but if your works are considered to be dead, then are, what would the Bible consider, to, consider you as? Your love has what? Wax cold. That's the same line there. We can agree with that. So that, we can agree with that. There's no doubt about that. If you're cold for the Lord, then it's the same thing that you're uh, doing dead things. Your Christian life is dead. If your Christian walk is dead, then you're a cold Christian. So we can all agree with that. I, every uh, Christian teacher can agree with that. That's what I believe. So we can all agree with that. Then, if we understand the spiritual working on how the Lord does it, we might understand His physical reasons why He has the physical cold. Because remember, He won't talk about uh, the spiritual cold if, he's, if it's learning something from the physical cold. He's trying to make us understand what cold is from something physical that we experience in our day and age. So there's a reason why he would say spiritually cold, spiritually dead. So then we look at physical life here. Isn't it true that when you're dead, that you're, they would say that your body is cold? But if it's warm and beating and it's hot, then what does that mean? Then see, you're alive. Amen. So you're alive right there. Amen. So then this does have to do, there's no doubt when we're looking about cold, it has to do with non-life. Uh, uh, yeah, our creation that we live in, the evidences of God creation even prove and show that there is, uh, that the cold usually has to do with something where it gets rid of life. It has to do with getting rid of life. But then also, the evidence of God creation shows that it does something where it refreshes. It restores the life right here. So, within this terrain here, death has to do with something cold. Wait a minute. So, if uh, who would like your Christian walk to be cold would be the devil. Right? Right? The devil would want your Christian life to be cold. Right. As an evil being who wants your life to be cold, I wonder if he has somehow connections to the cold. Sometimes it makes you wonder. Well, think about which being here would be tied to the cold. Which evil being would be tied to the cold? Death. 
That's the enemy of the Christians. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. They're all tied. And look at 1 Corinthians 15. Notice that death is our enemy. And there's no doubt that death has to do when your body turns cold. We would know that death seeped in. That death just entered. That death is present. Why? Why is death present and existent when the body's cold? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, when there's no warm life. Okay, verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. He's an enemy of us Christians, death. Why? Because he's tied to Satan. Hebrews 2. That's how Satan ties to the cold. Look at Hebrews 2. Good teaching. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 2. Notice that Satan, that he has the power of death. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. And then notice that Jesus Christ, he was able to destroy him. At verse 14, he was able to take over the power of death. Hebrews 2.14 For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. So Jesus Christ, he had to die so that he can take over death. But think about it. When Jesus Christ had to go through the cold of death, it also gave what? A new life. What you'll notice in the Bible is this. What you want to pay attention to is this. What you want to pay attention to is that whenever God does the cold, okay, see if it has to do... And he puts it within the context of life. See if there was something non-life before. And if God puts something as the cold that has to do with non-life, see if it has to do something ahead that might have to do with life. That will change your whole biblical hermeneutics. Oh, I just gave a new, brand new biblical interpretation heresy teaching. Whenever I see ice and cold, then it's going to, if it's non-life, look at life. If I look at life, then it's not life. <laughs> gave you a new biblical interpretation. But the point is this, is that it's an interesting thought to consider. Obviously, I'm not giving you a set rule of biblical interpretation. Scratch that. It's a joke. But the thing is, is that um, I wonder, and I want you to try it out, and you might see something. You might see something. Jesus Christ, when he went through the cold of death, guess what? Guess what? He resurrected. He gave new life. He came out of the ground. He came out of the cold and the icy grave of death itself. And by bursting through that, he was able to give us life eternal. That's the thing about Jesus Christ. Think about uh, when God sent that ice age. He drowned out the old life of Lucifer and his beings, and he decided to give new life. You and I, who are we? To give us the world. How about that? Isn't that interesting? All right, so Satan, he has ties and powers as well. So he has ties and powers as well with the cold. Now, what we discovered so far then with the cold is that if there's something that has to do with the cold here, then, and Satan has something tied to it, there's one. There's one that we see. That's death. There's a second one. Go back to the sea of glass. Satan's swimming in there. Look at Job. Look at Job 1. Look at Job 1. Now remember, he's kicked out of heaven, right? He's kicked out of heaven, but all of a sudden you see him in heaven. Look at Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. The Bible says, at Job chapter 1 and verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Okay, I want you to keep that in mind. He goes, so Satan's access, notice his access, is that he can go down. 
So he can go below the earth, and then he can go above the earth. Okay, below the earth is pretty obvious, that's going to be hell. And then above the earth, that's pretty obvious, that's going to be where he can have access to that sea of glass to talk to God up in heaven. So look at, so we know that Satan has access there. Now, uh, go to Revelation. Well, we're not going to turn there because we looked at that verse a thousand times. But I want you to look at another passage in Job, okay? We're going to look at what God talks about Leviathan. Go to Job 40. Job 40. But the evidence is Revelation chapter 12. If you go to Revelation 12, which you don't turn to, all right, because we looked at that verse a thousand times. But Revelation 12, Satan, he's swimming in the firmament right here. See that? Above the earth. We're going to look at Job chapter 41, excuse me. We're going to look at Job chapter 41. Now look at Job 41. Okay, let's recall before we read Job 41. The Bible says, uh, if we recall Genesis chapter 1, right? Combine Genesis 1 with Revelation 4. This interpretation stands, the sea of glass. That's where it comes from. It comes from those waters that God divided. But God also calls the waters, don't forget, He calls the waters the deep, right? There is no doubt that the sea of glass, or the waters God divided, is also called deep. You might say, why is that? Because Genesis 1, the Bible says that within that ice age where God sent that universal flood, uh, a darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay? So we know that it's called deep as well. Guess who's swimming in the deep? Look at verse 1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with the cord, which thou lettest down? So this is referring to Leviathan. And that's obviously Satan at verse 34. Look at verse 34. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. That's no doubt Satan. So Leviathan is Satan. But look where he's swimming. Look at verse 31. He maketh the what? Deep. To boil like a pot, he maketh, look at this, sea like a pot of ointment. Whoa. So notice that Satan, that he's swimming in the deep. That's why he can enter heaven. It's not a problem. Why? Even though it's a sea of glass, he's filled with fire. So filled with fire, he can face through that, which is something. Look at verse 32. He maketh the path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. So that's where he's swimming. That's his axis. So his two accesses that we see, all right, now this is going to open up a lot of keys here, which might be interesting. Ready for this? So his axis and his keys to enter through territory. One right here. Two Right here. He has access and keys. And notice the key root word why he can, uh, that these two things share in common. They're both cold. They're both cold. Now you use your head then is this, is that, which is what I gave in some interesting videos in other videos, which is intensely interesting, is that, uh, when you enter a playing field of, I don't know how it works in science, but when you hit at an absolute point somewhere, of uh, when numbers have no play and it's all zeros, you enter into a funny new universe. And another, th another thing is this, the sea of glass, this is absolute zero and you know, no matter, no energy, no numbers here. It's all zero. What happens when you go from the universe and pass this uh, plane of zero and no numbers, guess what? You enter a new territory. That's heaven. A new realm. Wow. When you enter in this life and death that we go by body temperature, once no life is in there and you hit zero, guess what happens to you? You enter a new territory. Wow. New realm. Amen. That's interesting. There were people uh, who talked about when you go to Antarctica, and then they talk about as they go into Antarctica, all of a sudden, 
the realm where it gets very cold just transforms and phases into something where people claim to have been in the bottom of the earth and seen hell and seen the devil and the min minions and the aliens. Wow. Strange. Wow. Strange. I don't know how much of that is true or false. But there's a lot of strange things in Antarctica and there's a lot of strange things when you go past the cold of the universe. That's true. And there are strange things undoubtedly when you go through the cold of death. Amen. There are people who try to do experiments with something that have to do with cold, both uh, scientists and spiritists. Uh, they've got something where they had these chips or something where it goes by cold temperature or something like that. And that keeps going where it can, you can enter a new phase of like new sciences, new technology, and strange things, which is intensely interesting. But then, so I see here cold that it has to do with, why? Because from this life, it becomes non-existent and you enter some new territory. That's how I see it as. I see a lot of tying connection here. There were not just scientists, but spiritists too. Spiritists who've experimented with the cold. And they want to go through the cold. So that, why? They can enter some kind of spiritual terrain or spiritual territory. It's very strange stuff. Very strange stuff. People, they'll, uh, they'll uh, practice about freezing to death or going through cold or putting their, body, uh, their state of mind and body through low temperatures or something because they just want to hit some kind of spiritual plane is weird to me. It's very, very weird to me. But the cold, there's something in there. There's some new phase that you're entering. That's, uh, that's the access here. And Satan, it's automatic for him. It's like breathing. Why? He is Leviathan the serpent. He can go down to hell and he can go up through that sea of glass. Now when he goes down to hell, that means then it makes you wonder if there's something cold below. Makes you something cold below. There were people who talked about, you know, the Challenger Deep and then a lot of stuff that is low. Uh, uh, when you go down deeper and deeper to the ocean, then they see strange things. They see strange things. So as above, so is below. Maybe in Antarctica there's something below that there's undiscovered. And you get these movies that talk about, you know, drilling through the ice through Antarctica and then you discover some kind of alien civilization. They fantasize that. They try to make legends out of that. It's very strange stuff. But I do know this, when you go through, the Bible does talk about when you go through an ice, you do enter a new territory. Look at 1 Corinthians. Wow. Whoa. Wait, I read Corinthians. I never read that. First Corinthians. And we're going to talk about charity. Let's look at chapter 13. Pastor, I memorized the verse. You did, you did not hide that word in your heart when you memorized it. First Corinthians 13. All right, basic chapter. Well, we all know this. But look at this. The Bible says at verse 12, For now we see through a what? Glass, darkly, but then face to face. That's with God Almighty. You have to pass through that glass, then you can enter the realm of the Almighty face to face. Look, why, why do we see through a glass darkly? This glass, one of them is right here, the sea of glass. Look at Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel 1. So we're seeing God face to face, darkly, abstractly, through that sea of glass. Ezekiel had that experience. When I say we, obviously you and I never saw the sea of glass, but there were, I mean, man, there are some people within mankind that did experience that. Look at Ezekiel 1. Look at this, what the Bible shows. The Bible shows at verse 22, verse 22, and the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the what? Terrible crystal, Terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. <laughs> Who are these heads? These are the heads of four flying creatures. At verse 5, at verse 4 and 5, and six. Verse four, five, and six, these are the four cherubs. And they're flying above, 
but above them is the firmament, and then above that firmament, the top, was what? It's all glass. Why is that? Because it's right here. So when these beings were flying to Ezekiel, and Ezekiel saw them, above their heads was what? Right here. Terrible crystal. How about that? That's something to see right there. Did you read that in your King James Bible? And that's why he was able to see God through there, but not... Look at verse 24. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters as the voice of the what? Almighty. Keep reading. Verse 26. And above the ferment that was over their heads was the likeness of a what? Throne. That's no doubt the sea of glass. Remember Revelation 4? The sea of glass had a what? Throne. Remember that at Revelation 4? As the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Oh. Someone sitting on that throne. That's the Lord. Yeah, you got it. You got it. But it's plain at verse 28. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the what? Lord! Whoa! How about that? Amen. See, that was God. But he was seeing it through this glass. He was seeing it through it darkly. The Bible says now we see through a glass darkly, but let's be honest, we don't see that sea of glass. But we know that Ezekiel did through the sea of glass. What is that glass? Well, you know, there's something amazing about that Bible. All right, look at, uh, look at the book of James. I'm going to look at the book of James. All right, now, let's look through here. James chapter 1 and verse 22. James chapter 1 and verse 22. The Bible says, look at this, the Bible is that glass, that ice. Look at, and let me tie it all together, right? Oh, this is so crazy. Okay, I got to do one at a time. Okay, all right. Let me do one at a time. Verse 22. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Right? The Bible. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a what? Glass. Glass. You know what else is uh, that ice? It is that word of God that Satan hates. Why? Because it is your access to that new realm and that spirit realm. That is the closest you're going to touch God. Because physically, you cannot do that. Physically, you cannot do that. And then, so this is your ice. And when, you're, when that Christian reads that word of God in his hand, then he's going to be in shock when all of a sudden he goes, Whoa, I'm seeing somebody else up there. I'm seeing what he's saying to me now. I'm seeing a little bit of Jesus Christ now, what he wants me to do. And you don't read that book, do you? That is, that's no wonder this guy don't want you to read it. Why? It is your access to the spirit realm that he don't have. Amen. How about that? He has the power above, below to enter a new realm. But he can only go so far. You can go all the way through God. But then... Uh, it's face to face that we're going to be in the physical plane and be in completion. We're going to be in completion of Amen. it. Now, let's tie it all together. If that Bible is that ice and that glass, then think about this. If it is that ice and in that glass, this might tie to what I mentioned earlier that I wrote. Look at this. Remember this guy? 
I talked to you about before that inspiration, the Word of God is God-breathed. But I showed, and inspiration comes from God-breath, but I also showed you ice comes from God-breath. So you know what God did? God did with your Bible? All He did was and then solid right there. There's your access to the spirit realm. Now are you going to take it? That's Amen. something. That is something right there. But you know why he but what he does right here is that it becomes a dividing line, that ice right here. This is the dividing line. He makes a dividing line right here. Why? Because this guy cannot enter this guy. And this guy cannot enter this guy. So then he puts in the ice. Why? Uh, at Genesis 1, to get rid of that old life and the, to create a barrier. I'm going to start a new life. He did the same thing with uh, heaven, put that sea of glass up there. Why? To make a boundary line. All the other uh, infested creation corruption away. Whereas eternal life is on the other side of heaven. He puts that ice to create a boundary so that non-life does not enter into life. That's what he does. Praise the Lord. That you do not have access to Jesus face to face. Why? Because look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. A lot of people always wonder, you know, why God is assimilated to the Bible so closely. But then Dr. Upman mentions that, but you know, it's assimilated so closely, yet there's a distinction. You know why? There's an assimilation but a distinction? Because He is the Word. Yeah. Amen. And then, but you're not seeing Him face to face. Okay. So He gives you this Word. Where you can be very close to that Word up there. Amazing. So there's a s distinction, but there's also a strong assimilation. Amazing. John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the closest that you have to Jesus Christ right here in the physical terrain. Why? Because God has to make that boundary ice so that corrupted creation does not get killed, uh, does not mingle with this one. Because when you saw God face to face right now, you know what's going to happen? Heaven and earth would not even exist. They fade away. So God, if the Word came down right now and talked to you, you know what happened? Your flesh could not stand that. And you would die out of existence. In order for mankind to communicate with the Word, God Almighty, God had to put ice so that Ezekiel can communicate with Him. And then with mankind, God's not giving you that physical terrain. He gave you, though, His book. And with His book, He puts that dividing line so that you right here with corrupted creation does not corrupt right here nor get killed and there's not a chaotic spree within our universe and it just goes kaboom. Without ice, we would not even exist. Ice has to be there to make the boundary lines set in place where this terrain of life would go here or this entity and the other entity would be right here. He put the ice over there to do it for a reason. And that's how I see all these connections, these amazing connections. Uh, but what, what will God do? Look at Revelation 21. Revelation 20 and 21. Once you get rid of the ice, what happens? Once you get rid of the ice, what happens? Look at Revelation chapter 21 verse 1. 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth... For the, first uh, for the first heaven, excuse me, and the first earth were passed away, and there was what? No more, no more sea. That's a sea of glass of Revelation 4. The sea of glass is gone. So now what happens? God combines everything into one now. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, look at this, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, 
And God shall be with him, them, and he shall be their God. Why? That ice is gone. But why is the ice there? Because God can't go down with you. God cannot go down with you. Physically in this terrain. All creation would just go kaboot. It would, it would not exist without the word. Look at Colossians. Colossians. Everything holds literally by him. Colossians 1. Colossians 1, 16. Colossians 1, 16. We're going to look at Colossians 1, 17. Or 16 and 17. That's better. 16 and 17. Uh, I don't want to go back to John 1, but the Bible says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, right? All things were made by what? Him. Created. The Word. Evidence is Genesis 1. God said, let there be light. God said, let there be this and that. Everything is from the Word when He created it. If there was no word, no existence. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Isn't that the word? Jesus? Yes. And then nothing would exist. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created by him and for him. Verse 17, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. They all, without that word, then guess what? Everything would go kaput. But guess what also comes out of his mouth? Not his word, but also... That's why they consist. That's why they consist. But not only that, you already saw the word is so similar to... They share a category together. They're different, but they share. Why are they different? Because the word's a word, ice is ice. But why do they share something? They share something. It's all from... Amen. And what did God do with your King James Bible? <laughs> Set in stone, ice. What did God do with that sea of glass to make the boundary line? Like that. There is something right there. There is something right there. Amen. There is something amazing about the cold. Let me give a quick dispensational one, shall I? <laughs> quick dispensationalism. Right. Every dispensation, how does it end? In great revival or an apostasy? Apostasy and falling down. Yeah. It doesn't go hot. It goes what? Yeah. Cold. cold. And then you divide it, and then thus begins a what? New dispensation. Wow, rightly dividing. You put in ice. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. All right. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I pray tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.